Okay. Hi. Welcome to this class. Um, I'm going to introduce Aaron uh, Aaron Pike from Pike Title, and um, he is actually it's it's actually Pike Law Firm, isn't it? I've got a law firm as yeah. well. Yeah. So he the, he's the law firm that is behind Pike Title, and he's here to talk to us about wholesaling and assignment contracts. So, thank you. All right. Yep. So I, I know everybody in this room, but for anybody who watches this later on, um, I'm an attorney. Most of what I practice is real estate law, um, and. Uh, my title company, Pike Title, it's a lay title agency, but I get a lot of legal questions that come out of there. A lot of the legal questions that I get center around wholesaling. And so for those of you who know what wholesaling is, uh, some of these things may be a bit of a review, but for those of you who don't, I'm gonna treat this as a 101 class for, for people who have not uh, had any experience with wholesaling. And so what wholesaling is, uh, it's basically a way of purchasing a house at a low wholesale price and then selling it to someone else without doing any updates or um, refinishing it uh, at, a, at a retail price and making a profit out of that. And so um, there are some good ways to do that. There are a lot of bad ways to do that. And there are a lot of legal risks that can come out of the bad ways if you don't know what they are and try to avoid them. So with that, um, we're going to go over some terms. So we all know what we're talking about, that we're on the same page. And then we're going to go over a process for wholesaling, uh, one that I recommend because there's a couple of different ways to do it. And then we'll go over some risks. But for those of you who are here, uh, if any of you are interested in wholesaling or if you've done it before, or if you have any questions about it, um, and you want to take a little bit of a deep dive, then just let me know and I'm happy to answer to those. All right, so what are the terms? Um, and sorry for those of you who watch this later, I'm sure you can't read any of them. Uh, the terms that we're going to discuss, wholesaling, what is it? I've just went over that briefly. Um, basically, we're buying a house at a lower price and selling it at a higher price, but we're not flipping it. Um, this is not flipping. Flipping is something that's a little bit different. And so we'll uh, flip is basically you actually purchase and own the house. You put some money into renovating that house, and then you sell the house to someone else after you've renovated, and after you renovated it. That's different than wholesaling because in wholesaling, the way that I recommend you do it, you actually don't actually own the house. You never purchase it. You just get a right to purchase it and assign that to someone else. And we'll go into that later. Um, so assigning is that process where you're gonna enter a contract with a potential seller. That seller is gonna to agree to sell it to you at a, at a particular price. And then for a fee, you sell your right to purchase at that price to someone else. And so you get an assignment fee. And so the assignor is the one who's giving their contract rights. The assignee is the one who's getting contract rights. And so there's, there's a couple of different parties. For those of you who are familiar with the real estate transaction, you know that there are purchasers and then there are sellers, right? So we still have those same parties in a wholesale transaction, but now we're adding assignor and assignee. And so uh, the original purchaser, if I'm the wholesaler, I enter a contract, I'm the original purchaser. But if I'm going to sell that contract, assign it to someone else, then I trade places. Basically, I'm selling my rights. So I'm no longer the original purchaser. I sell it to someone else. The person who I sell that right to purchase to becomes the new purchaser and also the assignee. And I become the assignor. And I'm no longer a part of that, uh, that original agreement to buy and sell. Okay. Uh, the other way to do it that I've seen, but in my opinion, causes a lot of unnecessary risk and complications is a double closing. Um, so instead of being uh, an assignor and an assignee, instead of basically giving someone else the contract right and never owning the property yourself, some people uh, I've seen actually do purchase the house. And rather than uh, assign that right, they'll actually close on their purchase. And then maybe that same day or maybe a couple days later, they'll do a second closing where they've already entered a contract with a new buyer and they sell the house that they just purchased to someone else. Um, <clears throat> the advantage to doing a double closing may be that you have a little more flexibility. So you can actually own the house, you can hold the house. If you wanna put a little bit of money into renovating it, you can do that. Um, with an assignment, since you never actually buy it, you never purchase it, you never own it, you don't have any right to do renovation. You may be constricted by the closing date because if you agreed to a 30 day closing and you can't find an assignee within that 30 days, well, you might be on the hook to buy that house. Um, so a double closing does give a little bit more flexibility, but it also opens you up to some risk. And then we'll, we'll go over that in just a little bit. All right, so here's the process. Wholesaling 101, right? Um, 
you got to find a house. <clears throat> and that's really the probably the trickiest part of the whole process. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who do this. Uh, and the ones that I run into who do it successfully are hustlers. They're the ones who are literally going door to door in some of these um, distressed neighborhoods and trying to find people who will sell them their house for cash. Uh, a lot of the sellers are people who are in financial hardship or um, they need money really bad right now. And so essentially you're finding distressed sellers uh, and oftentimes the wholesalers who buy these are people who are, are making those door to door sales pitches and, and finding people who are really desperate. Um, you enter a contract with that person. This is where most people trip up, okay? Because a lot of wholesalers go online on Google and they, they find some wholesale contract and they fill in the blanks. What I end up seeing a lot of times are contracts that <clears throat> don't have the necessary terms or that create obligations, <clears throat> excuse me, create obligations for the buyer um, that they can't live up to. Like a closing date, for example, that is in 12 days, um, but that, that wholesale buyer isn't able to get financing or they're not able to find uh, someone to assign the contract to in that time. So they end up in a difficult position. Um, and so that all can be fixed or prevented if you have a good contract, if you have a good template that you can use for that first step uh, after you found the house. So once you enter that contract to buy, uh, you're, you're gonna assign that right to someone else. And so the good wholesalers, the wholesalers that I've seen who are successful have a list of investors, people who they know uh, who are interested in buying real estate and fixing it up and selling it. Usually wholesalers and flippers work hand in hand because the oftentimes the wholesalers are purchasing houses that need a lot of work. Um, and so you need a flipper who's able to do that work, uh, has some money, has some expertise potentially, who can go in, fix the house and then sell it. And so the wholesalers that often do well <clears throat> are ones that have a list of flippers or a list of investors. Um, and as soon as they get that wholesale, that initial contract, they call up their investors and say, hey, I got this property, here's the price. Um, because speed is important. Usually you're gonna end up entering a contract <clears throat> that has anywhere between a 30 and a 45 close day closing period. And so you gotta find somebody to assign it to um, before that period expires, uh, or you could be in breach of contract. And you have to make sure that the contract, the, the contract to buy has an assignment clause in there. Yeah, and so that's a good point. So what I would say is don't use your standard um, Roanoke Valley. Actually, RBIR has an assignment clause. In there. Does it? So it says it actually can be assigned. Actually, okay. It, there is uh, one of the, it's, it's towards the end, but it says this contract may or may not be assigned. Okay, interesting. So that's good. So you, you could actually use a, 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 RVAR. an RVAR contract. Um, but what you're going to probably see in an RVAR contract is something that contemplates a more traditional buyer and seller. You're going to have probably paragraphs with things like financing clauses and inspection clauses. And I mean, at the end of the day, if you're a wholesaler, you're probably going to buy this as is because um, those are the kind of people who are going to be interested in selling directly to you rather than listing on um, a market or, or hiring a realtor. And so um, even though you probably could use the RBAR contract, it's, it's probably not the best tool for a wholesaler because you may end up obligating yourself um, to things that you don't need to. And from my experience, it's also kind of difficult to edit an RVAR contract uh, to an as-is contract. You can write as-is in the, the additional terms section, but you're still going to have to go through paragraph by paragraph and cross off things like inspection clause. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, actually, all you, so there's, it's either it is or is not subject to an inspection. So you can mm -hmm. say that it's not subject to an inspection. And then um, in zip forms, there is a Con, uh, um, there's a clause library that I, I, I believe is is established by VAR legal team. Is it an as is addendum that you sign or um, something like so, that? So no, it's actually you can just grab that clause, copy and paste it into additional terms on item 27, and it says that it's sold as is. Hmm. And therefore, by putting it in additional terms, it supersedes anything else that's in the contract. So 15A and 15B of our RVAR contract talk about um, condition on when you sell it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not careful, if you say that it's not uh, subject to an inspection, that means it's still subject to 15B. And 15B says that at the time of closing, all of the major mechanical systems are in working order. There's no roof leaks and there's no structural defects. 
So you would want to make sure that your clause that you put in in 27 negates 15B. Right. So. Yeah. So I haven't read through it, and, and that's great if you've got a, a clause library that, that's that thorough. Um, but you, if you have ambiguous terms, you want to make sure that you avoid any terms that conflict with each other, um, because obviously that's a source of litigation potentially if you have one part of the contract that says you must do X, Y, and Z, and then another con part of the contract that says, well, you don't actually have to do X, Y, and Z, then there's going to be a question in which, which terms apply, which ones don't. And so um, my recommendation is to get, if you're going to do this regularly, is to get uh, a one or two page contract, because that's all you really need, um, that spells out the very bare bones basics of your purchase. So who's the buyer? Who's the seller? What's the purchase price? You're buying it as is. It's going to be with cash. There's no financing clause. Um, and then you and then your closing date. Um, you may have a couple extra terms in there to talk about some contingencies like um, closing is on or around this date. However, uh, if buyer hasn't found an assignee, then closing will extend it for another 60 days. You can add some protections like that. But at the end of the day, I think simpler is better when it comes to a wholesale contract because you don't necessarily need to, to have 15 pages that talk about, um, first of all, it's an investment property. So a lot of the laws that apply to residential purchases don't apply to a wholesale transaction. So you don't necessarily need to disclose things like lead paint or um, uh, the fact that somebody, the buyer has the right to choose the closing company or... I think you have to do lead paint no matter what. That's a federal thing. That it, There's no exempt... I, I, I teach contract law sure. and, or the contracts class. Yeah. And, um, and I teach the pre-license class and mm -hmm. the lead-based paint is the one that has like no exemptions. Like if it was built prior to 1978, you have to have... Yeah, and it's for residential purchases. You're absolutely yes, right. So, yeah. so not, not commercial. And so when you're in a... Uh, in a wholesale transaction, we're talking about commercial rather than um, residential uh, because this is purchased for, I'm sorry, it's still a residential purchase, okay. but it's, it's, it falls under the commercial rules because it's being purchased for investment purposes. And so, oh, so, when we're, so a lot, so, so what you'll see is that federal and state law is primarily designed to protect a consumer, right? And so a lot of the laws that apply to consumers, like a first time home buyer or a uh, a residential purchaser are not going to apply to investors. And so, um, so if I came to you and said, all right, I want the simple contract and you then here's the three additional terms, mm -hmm. what would it cost me around about in, in yeah. dish, and how quickly can I get that contract? So we would draft a simple contract for you that you could probably use as a template for other contracts for $250. <clears throat> and it would be a, a two page contract that you could fill in the blanks and that would cover all your bases for a wholesale. Are you saying I could just have this and use this and fill it in? I wouldn't have to come to you? Not every time. Yeah, I would say not every time. Yeah, I, I would say every... I, uh, yeah. I'd like for you to produce that contract and sure. we will keep it in the library. Yeah, we can yeah. do that. Is there, have you ever heard of additional terms saying that if you are unable to find someone to purchase or assign the contract to, is that like a, a way for you to get out of the contract? So you can put any contingency that you want. The issue is going to be the negotiation that takes place between you and the seller, right? So uh, it, you're probably less likely to find a willing seller unless there is some hard and fast date that you're that you're obligated to purchase. Um, and so there may be some wiggle room there, like 30 days if we have a, an assignee, 60 days if we don't, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but if you can negotiate where it's an indefinite term, uh, that's between you and the seller. So... I would say um, negotiate the best mm -hmm. the best deal that, that you can uh, because giving yourself time is going to keep you out of a lot of the risks that come with wholesaling. All right, um, and so what that looks like is you you sign that initial contract, right? You got your two page contract, you got your wholesaler uh, who's the buyer, you've got your seller, the distressed seller who's the who's selling it to you. Once you have that contract and you found an assignee, the person who's going to who's going to purchase that contract right from you, you have a separate contract called an assignment contract. Uh, and so what that assignment contract does is it's very simple. It's one page. It references your original purchase contract and it references you as the buyer and the seller under that original uh, purchase contract. 
and then it appoints your right to to purchase um, to an assignee, someone else that you've that you've chosen who's purchased it from you, and you write in your assignment fee. So maybe that's a couple thousand dollars, maybe it's five thousand, maybe it's ten thousand. That's going to really depend on the deal that you got in the beginning, right? So if you bought something for forty thousand, it could be flipped for a hundred, then you're probably going to get a lot better assignment fee out of an investor. Uh, and so that's why that first step is probably the most important to actually doing this right. You got to find a house that makes sense uh, from a financial standpoint. I've seen fees as high as thirty-five thousand. Wow. Eight, sure. I mean, to, My, so, the one I got for the a one and only wholesale I've done was 25. Okay. Wow. That's a really good assignment fee. I, I would say that most of the assignment contracts that I've seen that come through Pike Title are between five and 10. That, that seems to be, and I've seen them as low as one and two, but I think those are, are, are situations where the, uh, the original purchasers get a little desperate. And so, um, they're willing to give up that contract right for a little less than they may have thought at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when, so, so once you sign the original contract, you signed the assignment contract, you proceed to closing what Pike title does and what a closing company does if they know how to do assignments is they're going to collect that full fee, the purchase price plus the assignment fee from the assignee, from the person who you sold your right to purchase from. Uh, and so we'll go over a little hypothetical at the end, but at the end of a, a successful wholesale transaction, the, the deed is conveyed to the, the new buyer, the assignee. The new buyer pays that original seller and the buyer also pays you, the assignor, your fee. Everybody gets paid uh, at the same time and closing takes place all in one swift transaction. Aaron, do you mind if I just jump? Yeah, come on. Um, the food truck will be taking orders for extras. I just wanted to spend our lot. So yeah. Whatever that is. Okay. That's right. We gotta get our money's worth. Good dessert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So here's all, here's a, like a typical wholesale hypothetical. All right. Um, your direct mail campaign finally paid off. Dewey Cheatham just inherited a small house in need of repairs from his mother, and he does not want to fix it up or sell it. He accepts your cash offer and signs a contract to sell you the house for $40,000, closing to be in 30 days. All right, so that's step one and two of the prior flowchart. He's found the house, did a direct mail campaign. Uh, you got a, a lead from that, and you ended up entering a contract to purchase a house for $40,000, okay? So step one and two. Your friend, Bob Builder, he's always looking for a good flip. You've got that list uh, of potential assignees all ready to go. And this house would be worth 100,000 if Bob spent about 20,000 to, to fix it up uh, with repairs and updates. So already Bob Builder is, is seeing money signs, right? You're, you come to him and he says, oh, I can, I can fix this up and sell it for 100. Uh, let's, let's negotiate here. So before closing, that's the key to an assignment. You're not gonna buy it yourself. You're not gonna close. So before closing, you assign your contract with Dewey Cheatham uh, to Bob for $20,000 assignment fee. So you bought it, you agreed to purchase it for 40. Bob's gonna give you 20. So it means Bob's gonna write a check for 60, right? Um, 40 to you, for our 20 to you as the assignor, 40 to the seller. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So it, it has to be an assignment fee? Like it has to be on the contract? Because No, it's a okay. separate contract. Separate yeah, contract. The, the contract between uh bob and wait so so you you and dewey have a contract mm -hmm. for you to purchase the house yeah and then you and bob have mm -hmm. a separate contract correct for you to assign your, your original contract correct. to bob correct so there's two contracts you're a party to both in the first one you're the buyer mm -hmm. and the second one you're the assignor mm -hmm. and so essentially what bob is paying you for in that second contract is to step into your shoes as the purchaser yeah. I got that, but do you have to disclose that or put that in the contract? No. Okay. Not technically. <laughs> yep. So there's no obligation. Well, yeah. So, okay. so under default common law, there is no obligation for the buyer to disclose that they are signing. There's no obligation for the seller to sign on to it. Um, is it a best practice to have the seller sign on? Probably. 
Well, I, they signed that they knew it was a signing contract that they were purchasing from me, but it did not have an assignment fee on there. Oh, yeah. And okay. so, so so if you're going to disclose anything, all you would disclose is the fact that you're not going to be the one buying the house. It's actually going to be Bob. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But I, I would not disclose the amount of money or that you're even getting paid for this assignment. You're just going to have a really unhappy Dewey Cheatham if you tell him that you made a lot, you know, you made 20000 by doing nothing, right? Because then Dewey's like, well, I should have just sold it to Bob for 60. Why Why do you have to be a part of this equation? So um, I would say. Wouldn't it be on the closing disclosure though? See, for me, they, that's yes. where they saw how much I made. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, however, the closing disclosure should yeah. be different for the right. seller than the buyer. And I. That's why I remember now they're all separate. They don't have all that one HUD anymore. And if it's done right, the assignment fee should only be on the buyer's right. CD and not the seller's CD. Huge. Okay. Yeah. And so. Wow, um, that, that's nice because when I did it, they saw on there. Was that a while back? The yeah, it's been. Always combined. I think 2018 when I did it. Okay. Now yeah. And, and so in this situation too, you don't necessarily need to use a CD. We would probably use a HUD or an Alta. And so that's even easier. Um, to separate out the buyer and the seller fees. No, I'm yeah. sorry, that was HUD was what I meant to say. I said closing disclosure. Okay, yeah. HUD, I was referring to. Yeah. Isn't that the same thing though? It, it, well, so <laughs> different, different formats for the same information. Closing um, disclosure comes from a lender. Yes, and that's what HUD you're interested in to see. Right? Yes, okay. closing okay. disclosure. You can direct the title company too and say, I want them on the separate ones. You know? So CD is gonna be required for a, a residential consumer transaction. Um, that's that's regulated by the CFPB, and so they, they, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau created this form. They require that lenders use it. They require that lenders disclose in three days. When you are outside of this mm -hmm. regulated, don't protective, world. Yeah. If you do world, not, if there is not a lender involved, then you, then don't you call have it a high CD. Yeah. Yes. True. But even if there's a lender involved and it's a commercial closing, you don't have to use a CD. So it's CDs are for consumer transactions. Gotcha. Um, okay. So. And in my opinion, CDs add a lot of, you know, they, they, they split up the information and they put it all you know, across three different pages. If you do use an, an Alta, if you're familiar with real estate transactions, it's all on one page and it's easier. In any case, okay, if you can hide, no, you're good. No, those are, those are good questions. If you can hide the fee that you're receiving from the seller, it's probably in your best interest to do that. And if, if it's set up properly, then the seller CD shouldn't include that for the seller settlement statement. Um, okay. When so when I put that I'm the buyer, do I put you know prior family trust or assigns on it? Do you, when I say it doesn't matter, buyer, you could do that if you wanted to. Um, but if you didn't put assigns, you could still assign it. Okay. Because um, that document you're going to create, it's does it say is it purchase agreement still or is it a sign for like so mine, mine just says contract at the top, but it doesn't really okay. it doesn't matter what it's what it's labeled. Okay. Okay. The, okay. What matters okay. so okay. so. Regardless of what it's labeled, regardless of what the specific terms are, a contract, if it's in writing and there is offer, mm -hmm. acceptance, Sorry. and consideration, mm -hmm. right? Okay. You guys learned about that. So that's all you need for a contract. Now, the other terms and the, the wording that you put in there are, are there to anticipate issues and, and hopefully head those off. Okay. Um, but if the, if the seller doesn't agree to assignments in, his, in that original contract, then they have to actually sign off on the assignment later. If they go ahead and agree to it at the beginning, it doesn't matter. Right. They don't have, they don't even know that you're not the one buying it, correct? So the default law is that a buyer or in a contract has the absolute right to assign their contract contract rights to anyone at any time. The seller has no authority or ability to, to hinder that. That's the default, right? So you can put in a contract, and many contracts do include language that say things like, um, assignment requires the consent of all parties or, or, or something like that to kind of limit what the default is. Mm -hmm. But if it's either silent on it where it doesn't mention assignments at all, um, or it says that the contract is freely assignable, which is probably the best practice, um, then you can assign it without notifying the seller. And the seller doesn't, the seller doesn't necessarily need to find out until they sit down and close it and find out that they're getting a check from Bob Builder instead of Wow. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing that's important, I think, is if for, for the, if you're the buyer and you're looking for an assignee, you have to market that, correct? Well, we do have laws that say that only the seller 
can or can market a property for sale. It has to be the legal seller. That's why we're checking, you know, your your seller names and stuff. That's why your seller name has to be in the MLS. Um, now, and a, a contract that has an assignment clause in there automatically gives permission from the seller to the buyer slash assignor to then market the property. So I guess I'm not familiar with that particular law, uh, but I will say you certainly can't, you can't misrepresent in an advertisement. And so if you are advertising that you are selling a house that you don't own, then that's probably going to be problem. That's going that's that's yeah. problematic. Um, but I, there could be other regulations that I'm not familiar with when it comes to advertising. So I, I I'm not going to speak directly to that. Uh, but you do want to be honest above all. Um, all right. So just to finish out the hypothetical and get onto the the some of the, the pieces that you want to have ready if you're going to do wholesaling. Uh, so we, we've got the contract between you and, and Dewey Cheatham for $40,000. We've got the contract to assign between you and Bob the Builder for $20,000. Closing comes around, Bob brings a check for $60,000. Closing company gives the seller forty. dollars Closing company gives you twenty. dollars Everybody walks away with what they contracted for, right? It's because the seller contracted to sell his house for, for $40,000. There was nothing in that contract that obligated you and only you to purchase. Uh, the seller is simply um, selling his house. He's his his consideration is forty thousand dollars. It's not you paying forty thousand dollars. So when Bob the builder steps in and, and pays that on your behalf, the seller got what he contracted for, uh, and you got a nice twenty thousand dollar check because you were able to find that seller before anybody else did. So wholesalers toolkit. What are some things that you want to have ready if you're going to be a wholesaler? Um, you should have a marketing plan. That's probably the first and, and most important thing. Um, unless you're just doing this on the side and you're hoping to stumble across a good deal, maybe that happens. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut. But you will probably not be successful unless you have a plan to find distressed sellers. These are people who have, have houses that they want to sell, but they don't want to go to a realtor to sell them. There's probably not that many people out there like that. So you can need to find um, how are you going to locate those people. Uh, the second thing is have an investor list. So this is kind of part of your marketing strategy. The investor list is also important because uh, this time is of the essence for these things. If somebody enters a wholesale contract with you, then they want you to buy that house from them quickly and they want to have cash when you close. And so you want to have a list uh, of people who are ready to purchase that off of you um, as an assignee. Purchase money. These are almost always cash, right? Uh, these are people, you can bring a lender into this. There's no rule against it, but lenders add costs and they add time. So when you're in the, when you're in, uh, when you're purchasing a house with a lender, the lender has to do their due diligence. They're gonna have to look at your financing. They're gonna have to look at the business prospects of this transaction and ultimately approve the loan. Um, best way to do it is remove the lender from the process. You get to make your own decision, but you gotta bring your own cash. Uh, and then, the purchase contract and the assignment contract, have those ready in a template format before you go out there because you wanna be able to get these contracts signed as quickly as possible. So um, I'll draft one for, for Tina for, the, for her purposes and, and uh, maybe she'll share that with everyone. So, but keep these nearby um, and don't go out on Google and try to figure out how to write your own because we've had, <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you more often than not, um, wholesalers come to me with, with their contracts that they wrote themselves. They probably got a, a, a Google template and they did it themselves. And I would say 60 plus percent of the time, they end up paying us to write a new contract for them because the original contract they brought us doesn't do what they thought it did. Either they didn't get an assignment fee or they weren't obligated and you know, the seller wasn't obligated to sell for the price that they thought, or there's, there's just ambiguity that causes legal issues. And so, um, best thing to do is, is have some good contracts ready to go. So, you know, and, and it's also against our code of ethics, the realtor code of ethics that we subscribe to, to, um, to practice, to unlawful or to practice law because we are not That's right. lawyers. Therefore, if we write our own contracts, I mean, we're, we're almost skewing the lines when we start writing our own stipulations and, and stuff like that. So I would say as the principal broker of Keller Williams, if you want something to go through this office, 
it better be a contract that is either a standard form or was written by a lawyer. If you try to write your own or grab it off, off of Google, I will probably um, kick it back. That's wise. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's not just real realtor ethics. Actually, it's um, it's a misdemeanor in Virginia to practice law if you're not a lawyer. So. Yeah. Um, Nobody's uh, that I know has ever gone to jail, but technically you could go up to jail, to, to jail for up to a year for doing that. Um, it's not being the first time. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to test the limits of that, right? So, uh, and then the last thing is find a closing company who does these, right? And oh, so, we, 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 but you got we, one we right here. That. We already have one. I, see, I can help you with the last three steps you of this. Put your of this logo underneath of it. <laughs> I know. Well, we do quite a bit of these, although I will say that even having done quite a bit, we still get contracts that stump us because people write their own and they get them off of Google. And you write your own, Mike, you know, I'm gonna kill you. Well, you know, that's well here's the you thing, know. I didn't write my own, I used the RBAR, but I had so many additional terms right. in there that were like, yes. I'm buying this, for re like I disclosed everything. Uh -oh. I told them their house was worth more. Like I was so scared to, to, you know, something to come back on me. So I told this guy, like, I can sell, I can put it on the market and sell it for more. You're, you're underselling it to me. I'm reselling that it to make nice money. <laughs> I like went and beat it like, a, you know, because I was scared. I didn't know, I didn't have anybody to tell me and I just went for it yeah. and I did it. And then I just put it, you'll have to read it. You'll probably laugh. <laughs> um, well, here's what but, I'll say. You know that you, you've done something wrong with your contract. If you have to write an email with your contract, explaining what your contract is supposed <laughs> to be doing. And so we get that more often than not. We just wanted to let you know, this is the buyer, this is the seller, this is how much I'm supposed to be getting. If your contract doesn't say that in a way that most people can understand, then you probably have some issues. For that. All right, so just wrap it up, because um, I do have to leave. Yeah, we're, uh, we're good. Yeah. So wholesaling this, wholesaling's easy money. It's not, it takes a lot of work to really do well on it. <laughs> Wholesalers have nothing to lose. Um, you do. You could be stuck behind the house and it could be a losing money proposition. Chances are you've got your own cash tied up in it. So if you pay too much for it, you could be left holding the bag for an asset that's not worth anything. And 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 I feel like a lot of times I've heard wholesalers here in the office and they're like not thinking that they might have to close on it. They think, oh yeah, I'll have it assigned. Well, well you might why, not. That's you, why I asked you have about to, the, the you term, have to make those, it good. Yeah, and, some of the I know one of the wholesalers that I've worked with, so that's if he doesn't good. sell it within a certain right. time frame, it gives him an exit strategy. Right. So he's no. If I haven't found someone to sign it to, them. he's yeah. not obligated yeah. to yeah. purchase it. But again, that goes back to the. Yeah, I mean, if you can get people to sign a contract like that, more power to you. And, yeah. and I will, I've seen many sellers in these assignment contracts that are not sophisticated sellers. And so you probably could get a lot of them to sign a contract like that. Um, and, it, and that definitely protects you. So uh, that, that's probably a good strategy if it's been working out for him. Uh, you can find a contract on Google. We went over that. All closing companies are the same. Not if they haven't done these before, right? Um, all right. So if you're going to do it, develop a process to find deals. Get a list of investors. Get a good purchase contract and an assignment contract. And don't invest more than you can lose because your money's on the line. And, and it's a it's a gamble whether you're going to make money on these most of the time. And there's our new office. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for lunch. Thank sure. you for the class.